It was almost breathing. Augustine Volcano is one of the most active volcanoes in the Aleutian Arc. It's erupted many times historically, I think 13 times, or 1935, in 1964, in 1976, in 1986. Not erupted from 86, and then starting in 2005, it started to show signs of unrest or restlessness. I'm Michelle Coombs. I'm a research geologist at the Alaska Volcano Observatory. We are standing in front of uh, many monitors that are showing seismic data from various stations that we have in our volcano monitoring networks uh, throughout Alaska. Augustine is nice because it kind of gives us some signs that it might erupt. Those signs started in late spring or summer of 2005. We started to see very low but elevated levels of seismic activity underneath the volcano. So that gives you kind of a, a zoomed in view of, of Cook Inlet. And so here's Anchorage. And you can see there's kind of the, that the stations are sort of clustered. And that's because for each volcano, you don't want to monitor it with just a single instrument. You want to have a, a cluster of them around so that you can better locate where the earthquakes are happening. So uh, there's Augustine. We also have GPS instruments uh, that sit on the volcano and they can measure whether the volcano is swelling or deflating, kind of measure, you know, like a balloon. And if you have gas pressure or magma rising into the volcano, it's going to make its flanks raise up. And so we can measure that. And we started to see that kind of inflation, very low levels of it, but that started to happen in 2005. So we had these signs that something may be happening, and they were similar to, to what had gone on prior to earlier eruptions. We also saw increased fumarole or, or gas activity, you know, big fumaroles visible at the summit that hadn't been there before. We took thermal cameras out to the volcano to measure the temperature of the surface, and that started to heat up. Uh, so we had all these different signs that were pointing to the fact that, that we were probably going to have an eruption. So in that sense, it was well-behaved because it gave us all this advance warnings. All that happened in the months leading up to January of 2006. So starting January 12th and then going on through the rest of January, we had significant explosions that produced new magma venting and fragmenting and forming ash clouds up to tens of thousands of feet, forming pyroclastic flows and lahars and significant voluminous explosions that we definitely needed to let people know about because they were potentially impacting aircraft and causing ash fall on communities and that kind of thing. So that really started in earnest in January. It, it kind of went through some different phases that were characterized by different types of, of eruptive activity. So the explosive phase lasted for a couple of weeks till about the end of January, and that was a bunch of very discrete big explosions that lasted for just several minutes each. And then, you know, separated by hours or days of inactivity. Then in early February, the volcano started to erupt in a more continuous fashion. We call that the continuous phase. Basically, lava was erupting very, very rapidly, so rapidly it couldn't stay at the top of the volcano. It was just basically collapsing and forming pyroclastic flows and ash clouds as it came out. And so that was in early February. Then there was a pause for a couple of weeks. And in March of 2006, the volcano came to life again and created two big lava flows down the north and northeast side. And so that lasted until kind of mid to late March. So the whole eruption lasted for about two and a half months. As a geologist, I'm really interested in what's going on under the surface. What is that magma doing before and during the eruption? Where did the magma come from? Where was it stored? Why did it come to the surface? All these questions. And so this eruption was great because it allowed us to both look at the rocks after the fact to try to reconstruct where they came from in the crust, but combine that with the GPS or the geodetic information about kind of the various cycles of deformation or inflation, deflation.
I mentioned these different phases of the eruption. Well, the volcano was doing different things during each phase. During the precursory and explosive phases, it was swelling that whole time. Even while it was putting out explosions, it was still swelling. And so that told us that even though it was e erupting, it probably wasn't done yet because it was still pressurizing. During that continuous phase, when a lot of material came out, it started to deflate. And so we could say, oh, well, lots and lots of materials coming out, it's deflating. During the hiatus for a couple of weeks, it inflated. And then during the final lava flows, it deflated. So it was almost breathing. And then we can go back and look at the deposits and the rocks that came out and correlate those with the geophysics and really get a very good understanding of what was going on under the surface. So for me, that was the, the most interesting and educational part of the eruption, to tie all that together. It's a beautiful, beautiful island, a fun place to work. Like I said before, it's one of my favorite places in Alaska to work because you can just go there, work on the geology, not have to worry about bears or you know, it's, it's a pretty, it's an unusual place in, in that respect in Alaska. It's a wonderful natural laboratory.